So now let me make the first of our technical asides, which you can skip over if you're not interested in the mathematical details, or for those of you that have a higher level, say uh, upper level undergraduate or even graduate level understanding of transport phenomena and fluid mechanics, I'd like to show you some of the uh, equations that are behind uh, the results that I've been quoting in, the, in, in all the lectures. So in particular, let's derive the Wells curve. So uh, part of that was a theory of drop settling. Uh, here I will quote a certain result because the derivation would be a lot longer. Actually, for that, you could refer to my online class 1050x, um, which is that if you have a droplet or a particle of a radius r and it is settling uh, under gravity, so it has a mass m and the gravitational force is mg, where g is a gravitational acceleration, then there is a flow of fluid around this object, and relative to the moving object, the flow is going the other way. And if you solve for the viscous flow around an object being dragged through a fluid, uh, then you arrive at the result of Stokes, which is the drag on that fluid. So if you're falling at a velocity v, then the drag force uh, is fd is 6 pi times the radius of the drop times the viscosity of the fluid uh, times the velocity of the drop. So we're falling at a velocity v, which is the settling velocity. Uh, and this here is the Stokes drag coefficient, which comes from solving the fluid mechanics of viscous flow around a, a sphere translating at a constant speed. We can furthermore uh, say that the, um, the uh, mass of the droplet, of course, um, is 4 uh, pi over 3 uh, times the density of the droplet liquid uh, times the radius cubed. And so given the mass of the droplet, there's a force balance between the gravitational force mg and the drag force when the particle reaches a terminal velocity. So if we think of this Vs as the terminal velocity where it's accelerated until there's a balance between the forces and it's moving at a constant speed, it's given by this force balance. And from that equation, we can solve for the settling velocity, which is mg divided by 6 pi r. And I'll, I'll, to use the same notation as before, I'll call this mu a of the air, but generally it's the viscosity of the ambient fluid around the particle as it's settling. And if we plug in uh, the value for mg, so that's uh, 4 thirds pi um, rho g r cubed over 6 pi r rho a. And so if we simplify that, we end up with uh, 2 ninths uh, rho g r squared divided by mu a. So that's the settling speed. And this is a pretty important concept, so I'll just sketch it here. So if we want to know what's the settling speed as a function of the radius of the, of the drop, then you see it grows like r squared. So it's like this. And then to put a scale on that, um, if we have a particle that is 3 microns, so that's an, really an aerosol particle, then the settling speed is around 1 millimeter a second if we use the density of water uh, and the viscosity of air uh, for this formula. And so that's already a fairly slow settling speed, millimeter per second, so you can already see the particles that are in the micron range will be suspended in the air for a long period of time as long as they don't evaporate away. Uh, and so that is now the second part of the calculation. Oh, and actually to finish the first part here, what we're left with is that the settling time is L over Vs, and that's the formula that we had uh, before, which is 9 mu a L divided by 2 rho g r squared. OK, so this is our first part of the Wells curve. So if I draw the Wells curve over here in the traditional way, where I plot on the horizontal axis the size of the particle, and in a downward axis we draw the time, then we have a curve like this 
for settling, which, and the reason it's drawn down, I guess maybe the feeling that as you're sort of falling down a particle of a certain size, you hit this curve and that's when you've settled a distance L and fallen out of the air. So now let's look at uh, evaporation, which is our second topic. Um, I have lost my blue, here it is, okay. So, so these droplets are getting very small as they're evaporating and it's happening very quickly, um, as we shall show in a moment. And so a natural assumption is that the uh, process is, is limited by the diffusion of water vapor away from the droplet. Because essentially we have this little drop, we have a little droplet here with a certain uh, size r, which is now going to be varying with time. So it has a radius r of t. And it's really close to the surface. There's an equilibrium concentration, we'll call it Cw, of water, which depends on the temperature. So that's kind of this, that's the saturation concentration of water vapor in the air. But then, if the water is going to evaporate more, it would create more concentration, which would then recondense on the particles. So, for in order for it to continue condensing or continue evaporating, that water vapor that is produced has to diffuse away. So, there's going to be a gradient of water vapor uh, going outwards from Cw uh, is the concentration, you know, at position R, and then far away there is a sort of diffusion layer thickness, delta, and far beyond the diffusion layer thickness, the concentration is gonna approach the uh, equilibrium concentration in the ambient air. C um, at infinity is gonna be Cw times the relative humidity. So that's the ratio of the concentration of water vapor in the air to the saturation concentration Cw by definition. Okay, now the math problem that we have to solve for this diffusion problem with a moving boundary in this case, but we'll assume it's pseudo steady, is dCdt is the diffusion coefficient of water times the Laplacian of C, so just the diffusion equation with these two boundary conditions. Now, an interesting aspect of three-dimensional spherical diffusion is that at first the diffusion layer grows, but it very quickly reaches a steady state. And if we assume that that diffusion time to reach this distance delta is uh, fast, so they reach the steady state, so it's a kind of quasi-steady or studio-steady uh, shrinking of the droplet with sort of a diffusion layer around it that's always kind of at the steady uh, value, then it turns out that this diffusion layer is of order the particle size. So as the particle shrinks, the diffusion layer also shrinks, but it has a well-defined thickness, as opposed to diffusion in one or two dimensions where the diffusion layer just keeps growing out to infinity, for example, like square root of time. You don't reach a steady state in an infinite domain. So the bottom line of this calculation, which I will not go through right now, is that the flux of water on the surface is the area of the surface at a given moment, where the size is r, uh, times the uh, essentially Fick's law, where the driving force, the change in concentration from the surface to the bulk, is Cw times 1 minus relative humidity, the diffusivity of water, and then divided by delta, the diffusion layer thickness, and it turns out that with these coefficients here, that's ex it turns out to be exactly R. So this is not a scaling result, but actually an exact result for pseudo-steady spherical diffusion of water vapor. So now we have the flux on the surface. It's uniform on the surface, and it's consumed to be pseudo-steady. And so then I can write down that the change in the size of the water droplet uh, volume, which is 4 pi over cube 3 4 pi over 3 r cubed is equal to minus the volume of a water molecule uh, times uh, the flux of water. So that's basically my volume or mass balance um, of water. So if I plug this in here, then I get uh, dr dt is equal to, uh, let's see, collecting all the terms here. So derivative r cubed is, uh, two r, uh, is 3 r squared, so the 3s cancel. Um, and then I have a 4 pi r squared, which cancels this 4 pi r squared. So I just have dr dt is minus vw dw cw 1 minus rh uh, divided by r. If I put this r on the other side here, then I have, um, I'll just continue the derivation here. 
I have um, r dr dt is equal to all this stuff. So minus uh, dw dw cw1 minus rh. And then this expression here can be written as 1 half uh, the derivative of r squared. So what we find is that r squared is linear in time. Uh, and then using the boundary condition that we start out at um, a certain initial value r naught, then I'm going to get that the r of t is the initial value r naught times the square root of 1 minus t over a certain evaporation time. And that evaporation time is given here um, by... Uh, r0 squared uh, times basically all these coefficients here, uh, which, where I'll, I'll separate out the effective humidity, and then a bunch of other coefficients, which you can see have units of length squared over time, because r0 is a length squared, so it's effectively some kind of diffusivity. And what we get from this calculation is that this effective diffusivity that goes into this uh, expression is there's a factor of 2 from this guy, there's a 2. Vw, dw, cw. And if you plug in values for water vapor, uh, for the saturation pressure and the diffusivity and the volume of water in air, then this coefficient turns out to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 9 uh, meters squared per second for pure water. And that's where you get now the second part of the Wells theory, which is the evaporation, which gives you a curve looking like this, um, so that there's this sort of, in this theory, a natural uh, crossover between large drops, which in this case here are ones that are large enough to settle out of the fluid before they evaporate, and small drops, which um, evaporate. On the other hand, for true biological fluids that appear in uh, respiratory droplets, the evaporation is limited by solutes and salts, which stop the evaporation and, in fact, can attract even more water in some cases, so that the evaporation part of it is not as accurate. And we tend to see that the settling part is more important to consider, uh, given an equilibrium distribution of droplets that has been measured and is understood uh, to come from different types of respiration.